Hi, this is Pastor John coming to you from the Meditation Gardens here at the Gender Road Christian Church, and I'm glad that you've chosen to take the time to, to watch and participate in the message that God has for you today. One of the ways that you can do that is definitely follow along in your Bible, read the Scripture, pray that the Holy Spirit helps you understand it in a new way. So let's get started. Our scripture this morning is taken from James um, the third, James the third, James 3, 13 through 4, 3. And I guess John's not going to say anything about it. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disordered order and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and you cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get in your pleasures. Thus ends the reading. I had planned to say something, but I was going to wait until the end. <laughs> and what I was doing was I was checking in on Facebook. Have you ever done that at church? You can do that, you know, I won't, I won't be upset. You can get on your phone, you can check in. So I just checked in that I had just shared the peace of Christ during worship service. So if you have your phone, you can do that. If not, you don't have to. So, um, so interesting, we, we almost miss some key things in this scripture in chapter 4, verse 2, where it says, you do not have because you do not ask. Have you ever tried to make a decision and it's, you just really don't know what to do, and your mind's kind of wandering, you're going back and forth. Maybe you even make a pro and con list, or you feel like you really want to do something because that seems like the right thing to do, but it's just, it's just not settling right in your stomach. Well, here we get these words from Paul or in James, which helps us understand this type of wisdom, because see, the wisdom, this revelation that comes from God is pure, and it's good, and it's peaceful, and it's gentle, and it's willing to yield. And so the advice for us is to understand that when we're struggling with some sort of decision in our life, to give it time, to not force the issue, to go back to God in prayer, to start to discern not just with our mind or with our emotions, but all of ourselves, which is led by our soul, by our spirit, letting God's spirit work within us. And then we know that right decision to make. And then in verse 4, 2, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, you do not have because you do not ask. How many of us have just gone right ahead and never really asked God what to do or the decision we should make? Or we've not asked God for those things that we're really seeking in our life. And then as we continue to ask, the interesting thing is God knows what you need before you ask it. And you may be asking for what you want, but which might not necessarily be what you need, and you might be asking for things. So as we go through that spiritual discipline of asking and asking and asking, what happens is, is that's a refining process. 
It's a process by which our will is put up against the will of God, and we realize that tension there, it starts to go away as our will comes in line with what God's will for our life is. And then we have that pure comfort, gentleness, the wisdom that comes from God. So may we be in remembrance of that the next time we are praying that we are trying to make a decision. May we truly pray about it, and may we ask. Amen. So do you know why we have a prayer of illumination, or in this case, a song of illumination? It's really a prayer. To illume? Oh, to get you in the, in the mood. Yeah, in the mood to illuminate. Right, exactly. Um, so a lot of times, whether it's in a wedding or a funeral service uh, or church service, you'll have a prayer of illumination, and that is usually prayed right before the scripture is read. And so the prayer of illumination helps me to align what I'm saying with what, what God wants to be said, and it aligns all of us together so that as we hear the scripture read, as, as we reflect and think about as we're, as we're hearing the message and um, as we then go through the week, that our thoughts are in line with God's thoughts and that the Holy Spirit takes then what is being said and allows us each individually to hear what we need to hear for that week. So that no matter what I say, by the time it gets to you, you're hearing what you need to hear. So that's why we have a prayer of illumination each time. It's that last final step of um, consecration uh, before we get into the scripture and the message. So here we are in the Gospel of Mark. We talked from, uh, read from here last week. And since then, Jesus and the disciples have been busy. They have gone up on to the mount. They've seen the transfiguration where Elijah uh, showed up and Moses and, and Jesus was transformed. And then they came down and they had questions about the ends of times. And then they tried to heal this boy with a demon in him. They couldn't do it. So Jesus had to step in and, and heal. And so they've been busy. All right. And so Jesus knows this and he takes them away and they're traveling now to a different city. And so here we are in chapter 9, verse 30. And hopefully if you have your Bible, you can take them out, pen in hand, ready to make notes. Here we go. They went on, there, on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know it. So Jesus is traveling with his disciples and doesn't want anyone to know where they're going or what's happening. He did not anyone, want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. And we just covered a lot of stuff. So they're traveling. Jesus takes the time to step aside from the ministry to teach his disciples. So he realizes that they need to be taught. There needs to be some special time. This is a special time. Why this does not sitting well today. It was fine all during the first service. Anyways, um, so he's teaching his disciples. He's taking some special time. What does this model for us? Where Jesus says, I know you've been busy, disciples, out healing, and you're seeing all this stuff, you're traveling around, but I want to take some time just with you to teach you stuff, to teach you about what it means to be a disciple. Do we take that time with Jesus so that Jesus can teach us? If we're not taking time during the week to read our Bible or to have an app on your iPad or your iPhone or a favorite devotional book in which you look at, Somewhere where you're spending time with just you and God with scripture or some sort of devotional so that you can be taught, so that Jesus can teach you. And so he says to them, this is now his second passion prediction, and it's very similar to chapter 8, verse 31, but it's different. For he says, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands. So we have this distinction between the divine and the human hands, and they will kill him very directly, the human desire will kill the son of god but three days later after being killed he will rise again but they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him so being afraid and fear and the disciples not understanding that's a very common theme throughout the gospel of mark the disciples don't understand it they never seem to really get it 
Even in the ending of the Gospel of Mark, the women run from the tomb in terror and afraid. There's fear. They hear what Jesus is teaching them, but they're afraid to ask him questions. They don't ask him any questions. When have you been afraid and sat silent? When have you wanted to know more and not ask questions? And so we have here something that really speaks to us. Because last week, Jesus is asking the questions. Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? So this week, Jesus was in your living room, sitting by you on the couch, looking at you and saying, who do you say that I am? Well, Peter had the answer, we are the Messiah. But knowing the answer doesn't necessarily mean we understand what that answer entails. So we have maybe an answer, but now do we really have questions? Are we afraid? What does fear do to us? How does it paralyze us? How does fear impact our faith? How does fear make us afraid to take a step forward in faith and to to be in service and to get clarification, to understand what God is doing in our life? Let's go on with verse 33. So this section deals with who is the greatest. So the disciples then were traveling again, and they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? Have you ever done that? You've been traveling home, your kids are doing whatever kids do in the back, right? So you finally get home, and and you know what they were arguing about. You know the answer. But you ask them anyways, what were you arguing about? You see, Jesus isn't afraid to ask any questions. And what do the disciples do? They're silent. Verse 34, but they were silent for on the way they had argued with one another on who was the greatest. You see, they don't get it. They fail to understand the teachings and what it means for Jesus Christ to be the Messiah, to be the servant, to die as the one, the lowest of all that brings salvation for everyone. They just don't get it. And so they're in this honor and shame society. I mean, they're just like us. They're trying to figure out who's got it right, who's got the seat of honor, who sits on the right hand or the left hand of God. And they're trying to figure out, well, I've been a disciple the longest. I think it was Jesus that called me first. He really loves me. He sent me a thank you note. He waved at me, right? I mean, so they're talking, who knows how they really argued, but they're, they get, they're not getting the point because even in their group of 12 and probably the others that are following along, they're trying to figure out, well, who really is the best? Who's the smartest? Who's the greatest? Who's best looking? Who whatever? Who's Jesus, you know, going to want to lead this group? Aren't we just like the disciples as we kind of argue about some things that don't necessarily align with what Jesus is saying? This is what I need you as the church to be doing. This is how I love you. This is what I'd like to teach you. This is how I'd like to be in relationship with you. And we miss the point. We miss it. And we argue and all this and that. And so then Jesus, in verse 35, he sat down. Now, this is a biblical cue for you. You're reading the Bible. It says he sat down. So in true rabbinic fashion, he sits down to now teach. So as readers of the Bible, our ears are perked up for something is going to be taught to us. He called the 12 and said to them, whoever wants to be first among, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. So whoever wants to be first must be the last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. So Jesus takes a little child and puts it among them and takes it into his arms and says, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not just me, but the one who sent me. I don't think you got it. I think you missed it. Because in your mind, you're picturing this nice, sweet, mild Jesus holding a little child. It's such a sweet, innocent picture, isn't it? We miss the radical nature of what Jesus has just done. Because in antiquity, the children really didn't mean squat. They had nothing to offer. 
They didn't help your place of social prestige or your power or your ability to get ahead. In fact, children or, or, or people didn't adopt children. They adopted adults if that would help them get ahead in life. And so here it is where Jesus is first saying, if you want to be first, you must be the servant of all. In other words, if you want to be great, it's not by what you do, accomplish, achieve. It is by your acts of service and how you approach. Because you see, you've received this wisdom from above that is pure and gentle and willing to serve. And so in doing so, you're then welcoming people, loving people. As the servant of all, you are the one who eats last. You're the servant of the servants. If you don't eat, it really doesn't matter. You're going to make sure everybody else is taken care of. This is the role that you are to take. The disciples would have been kind of shock and in disbelief. And then Jesus does something that would be inconceivable. He takes this child who had little value and says, you need to welcome them. Welcome this little child. Welcome this servant. Because you see, the child would have been the person today that you don't like. The child would be the person that you don't think belongs in the church. The child would be the one that really is not of, uh, of your time, of inconsequential. Maybe it's the refugees. Maybe it's somebody who's gay. Maybe it's somebody that you don't like. Maybe it's somebody that you like not to like because they're really not a good person. But Jesus is still saying, you need to welcome them. You need to welcome the person that is outcast, that is out there. And when you do so, you also welcome God. You see, we don't get it. We still have a hard time getting our minds and our thoughts around the radical nature of what God had just done through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus comes in against any social and religious norms and says, this is what it means to be a servant of all, so much so that I'm going to die on the cross for everyone. And so we get wrapped up, the disciples get wrapped up on who's the greatest, who should really be here, where should people sit, what do they look like, and we get wrapped up in those same situations. And Jesus is saying, look, this one who seems to be of little value to you, just as important, just as loving, what are you willing to do? And so we have a hard time grasping that. We miss what is happening there? Because the disciples were afraid to ask questions. They were afraid to ask him, what does it really mean to be the Messiah? See, in order to have a clear understanding of what it means to be a Messiah, gives us then a clear understanding of what it means to be a disciple, to follow Jesus. And so when we're afraid to ask questions, we're really limiting our ability for our relationship to deepen with Jesus Christ because they were afraid to ask questions, which means a relationship with Jesus was somewhat estranged. There was a separation to it. They, were, they weren't going deeper, right? What do you do when you argue with somebody? What do you do when you argue with your spouse or your partner? What well, you start asking them questions. Why did you do this? Da, 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 and all, right? You're asking questions, sometimes to prove your own point, but... You're asking questions which develops this relationship. But they were afraid. What happens is fear paralyzes us. What does it mean for Jesus to be your Messiah? What questions then do you ask? What questions then do we ask as a church? You know, Jesus, who are the children of our day? Who are the children that we can serve? And again, I'm not talking about the cute little babies. We just dedicated, he's about six months old, five months old, with this beautiful little child at the 930 service. We're not talking about that child. We're talking about that person you argued with at work. We're talking about that person that led your kid down the wrong path. We're talking about that person that tells off-color jokes. We're talking about that person you think is a sinner. Those are the children of the day that Jesus says to welcome. And so when we start asking questions, who, do, who can we serve? We start asking questions, what is a God that is going on inside of me? If you're the Messiah, if I say you're my Messiah, my Savior, that means that I'm following you a certain way. So are we willing to ask questions that to get at the heart of what's going on inside us. Because that can be fearful. 
Because we really don't want to deal with the stuff that's yucky inside of us. Because that might then make us realize we have been wrong and we've got to say sorry to the same people we definitely don't want to say sorry to. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I learned who I am by discovering who Jesus is. I learned who I am by discovering who Jesus is, that the way to self-fulfillment is the way of self-denial. Again, not that we're to have lacking things in life, but that our self-denial, our taking up the cross, our willingness to be the servant of all means that we put this gospel, we put these teachings of Jesus at work in our lives day by day so that when we wake up and say, this is the day the Lord has made, that's another way when I wake up to say, this is the day, Lord, you have made. I messed some things up yesterday, but today is a new day. And I've got just as good a chance to mess things up, but today is a new day. And I'm certainly going to try differently. And then Jesus, what do you want to do in my life? Asking questions. They were afraid to ask questions because you see there, this fear and the disciples afraid to ask comes throughout the whole um, gospel of Mark. And what it means is it's the, the impact of it is not lost in antiquity. It's meant for us as successive generations of disciples that we can relate to that yes we will make mistakes we will not understand we will be confused we will argue amongst ourselves but Jesus continues to give this invitation to follow him time and time and time again if we were to be perfect like Jesus that would not be good news we can't be but what is good news is that Jesus continues to call to us time and time again saying follow me Amen. I love being outside and being surrounded by God's creation. And I pray that today's message has been a blessing in your life. And I look forward to hearing from you or someday being able to speak with you about how God has been part of your life today.